The Satanist is a vile masterpiece, and it's Loudwire's pick for the metal album of the 2010s. We're in Warsaw, and we're going to talk to Nurgle about the record, about its themes between good and evil, conformity and freedom, and do some yoga. When you cut tomatoes, don't do it like that. Do it like that. I learned it a couple of years ago. So you're avoiding this f***er. No one likes that f***er, right? So you just go like this. And uh, you got a nice slice with no bullshit in the middle. I think that's pretty f***ing revolutionary. <laughs> I suggest, strongly suggest that art should be uh, exterritorial. That's why I think that, um, like, whenever someone tries to, you know, you know, have some agenda, there, I'm like, eh. NS black metal was was strong in Poland. Right. Uh, already back then, when I was a teenager, I, was, I felt that it's wrong. You know. Yeah. I'd be talking to these guys like, man, like, it's no place for politics. You know, I don't want to be part of it. Dead Kennedys, you know, mm -hmm. has a song, Nazi Punk's F*** Off, and it's a great yeah. song. Yeah. And uh, I, I totally back it up, and I agree, and it's political, but generally I'm like, I'm a Morrissey fan, Yeah. and I know a lot of people f***ing hate him for the stuff he sure. says, but you know what I do? I never dig there. <laughs> I never go deeper, because maybe... I want to remain a Morrissey fan, you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. So I don't want to go and read his interviews, you know, because mm -hmm. maybe that's not for me. And I want, I just want to stick to to entertainment and to to songs and to music that itself is 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 is, is, a, is a wisdom. Yeah. So. I guess that you get my point. Yeah, no, there's, there's a danger in, in putting yourself too much out there sometimes because yeah. with any person on the planet, you're always going to find something that you disagree with or you don't like about that person. So if you focus on that and you characterize them only by that, then you can paint them to be exactly who you want instead of who they actually are, which is true. a complicated human being. True, true, and it's getting more and more difficult when someone gets, when one gets offended, it basically speaks of himself and not about, you know, the the the, the reason, the source of his uh, right. uh, the, the, the offensiveness. Okay, you know what I'm trying yes. to say. When I get people like, okay, every now and then people try to into to bring me to court for this and that case, blasphemy, blah blah blah, and I'm like, in the end of the day, I'm like, guys, I'm an artist. This is my territory. In my, within my territory, there's my social media. There is my uh, there's uh, con like venues that I perform in, uh, magazines that I appear in, TV uh, that I every now and then pop up mm -hmm. in, and uh, this is my space. If you don't like it, do not enter. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. Why? You enter willingly. You enter this space. Get oh, so evil, and then go to the court. It's there's, there's no logic there. I didn't realize this for a very long time, but how uh, politicized yeah. you became, yep. and how you became sort of a political 
prop because you were appearing on uh, The Voice of Poland at that time. Mm. And there was also that same year uh, an election happening. So a lot of these groups, of course. a lot of these groups were using the fact that there was a Satanist on television uh, as a platform for their message and sort of yeah. demonizing yeah. you yeah. to yeah, of course. Of course. push their own agenda. Yeah, yeah, divine, divide and rule. That's that's the ancient formula, divide and impera. That's what the Polish government does. You know, they just they need enemies and they need scapegoats. And I'm their, one of their favorite scapegoats and enemies. In 2010, Nurgle was facing up to two years in prison under Polish blasphemy law for tearing up a Bible on stage. He called the Bible a book of lies, and the case went all the way to the Polish Supreme Court. It was just the beginning of a decade of legal trouble for the behemoth frontman. You know, regularly I'm being called to court or uh, to, you know, for like interview by the police. Mm. It's, it's, it's insane. I mean, just leave me alone, you know, I truly, I, I pay a lot of taxes in this country, you know. I'm not saying, you know, I'm not asking for immunity here. Mm -hmm. I'm just asking for protection. Protect me from opportunists and idiots. <laughs> Poland, please protect me. I need you because I give away a big chunk of what I earn so you can raise your schools. Unfortunately, you can raise this mother in churches, you know, you're gonna put a sentence on me for being, um, I don't know, abnormal, different, uh, uh, you know, calling me a public enemy, um, uh, evil incarnate, this and that. Well, it's cool metaphors, but honestly, am I one? I don't think so. With my art being radical, music being extreme, and so on, so on, so on. That's that's why it's so vi it's supposed to be violent and evil, and I, I need those metaphors to express my disgust, my frustration, you know, towards those um, institutions and objects that, to me, are the HIV of today's world. You were tangled up in court for the blasphemy hearing for five years, I think it was. It was a really long time for something that happened in hmm. 2007. And they kept finding ways to re-charge you with slightly different crimes each time. And you got acquitted, and you got charged again. Yeah. Uh, you know, and during this time, you were also fighting cancer. Yeah. <laughs> that must have been a very difficult time in your life. You can, you can, Imagine that those problems were the least important on the list of you know problems in my life back then because I was like with all my vitality and life affirmation and lust for life, I was all focused on just beating the shit out of this motherfucker that was um, growing here. Like the phys physical form was right in the middle of my chest. When I was breathing, I was whistling. Mm. <laughs> it was kind of funny. I mean, I remember when I was out, like when my ex went out to Greece and I was already sick and I was falling asleep and she was laughing, why are you whistling? Like, because when I, when I was breathing, it's like, ee, ee. <laughs> I'm sweating more, like triple what I usually sweat, why? And then, then I ended in the hospital, uh, it happened to, that I had like a one and a half liter, which is three times this, three times this in my, uh, it was stuck in my lungs. And then they would just uh, put like a pipe, like they would just drill the pipe through my ribs straight to my lungs. Mm -hmm. And I'd be walking with a can for like two days. Step by step, I would just get stronger and stronger. Started working out. Started with Nordic walking first, just walking. Mm -hmm. Then uh, I really got into running, so I just couldn't st stop running. And I remember it was spring, the sun was up. I was, I had an apartment uh, right by the beach uh, in Gdansk. Every morning I would just put some heavy music on my earphones and, and I would just, you know, run into the forest and listening to fucking, you know, hard rock and heavy metal and feeling alive and it, I remember it was a beautiful feeling, very vital, very 
uplifting uh, spirit. And uh, when I got to the point, you know, with my brain and my body that I was ready to, you know, fight back those, mm, you know, uh, surreal accusations, mm -hmm. I was like, okay, you know, round three on the ring, Nigel, kick the shit out of this, you know, idiots. And that's what I did. Did you see um, the life and struggle of Shukalski on Netflix? No, I haven't seen it. It's uh, it's a documentary on uh, on Polish artists, a painter and a sculptor, and uh, it's insane. It's amazing. It was actually produced by Leonardo DiCaprio. This is one of his works from seventy. Most of his works uh, pre-war, because uh, yeah, war started in September 1939 um, uh, and he was based in Warsaw and uh, his um, gallery was bombarded. His work from his painting from 1919 that will be put on auction that I'm considering, maybe I should get it. So I'm going to take you there and you'll see it. I opened it. Oh, yeah. Yo. Souvenir from Poland. Oh, deep hoodie. Thank you, man. Wow. Look at that. Yeah. Look at this. It's a beautiful quality here. That's nice. Woo. Yeah. I gotta say, Behemoth does make the best merch. True. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Ready? For night ride. <laughs> All right, this is right. almost like the Knight Rider car. It is. <laughs> it kills you in the air. It does. Good old German, German work. I was watching an old interview with you the other day. Uh -huh. I wonder if you remember. It was on Polish television yeah. in... It was the early to mid-2000s. And it was with a guy who I think was on... He was like an idol judge or host or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're talking uh, Kuba Wojewódzki. That's him. And it was so hilarious because at the end, he referred to you only as the Satanist. He didn't even call you by name, but I thought that is so amazing. Like 10 years from that moment, he has no idea what those two words, the Satanist, oh, yeah. is that's going to really mean. That's how we are uh, getting into the Satanist mode now, right? Yeah. So what do you want to know about the record? Well, let's start out with the, uh, I saw the virgin's Spawning forth the snake. Mm -hmm. How do you come up with a line like that? I don't know, but I just felt like I really wanted to have a word cut <laughs> in the lyrics. I remember I had this quote in my head, this caption, and I just wanted to use it. And from like it felt like you know to open with that strong uh, line would be like uh, would be just self-defining. It would be like, hey, I mean, this is it. This is. This is just, this is a knockout from the very start. Uh, we're gonna do a short break from the Satanists now and continue later, but we're gonna see the uh, paintings now. All right, so let's do it. Yeah, this is uh, two drawings from uh, Gisela Bekczynski that are being auctioned today. I might, uh, you know, I might try to bid. Yeah. Let's see what happens. I mean, I, <laughs> what is it that you like about these in particular? Well, I mean, it's like two, two different decades because this one was, uh, it's 65 and this is 90. <laughs> I don't know how to explain that. I'm going to show you the paintings in a second. They're just, okay. they're just so sur surreal and, and dark that there's just, mm, it's, it, there's no limit to the surrealism there and to darkness that that holds uh, that his uh, work works hold and uh, and he's a uh, he's a household. This is amazing, I think. I see it's like 70s. Uh, I can see the difference in the in the technique and. Uh, 89, it's okay, and this is like third uh, 93. And he was murdered. He was? He was murdered, yeah. Wow. So, so stupid. It was just a, a, like very, 
mindless robbery. The guy who was helping out in the house, which is, you know, just like fixing the house. Yeah. He just came down and he was young and he was just maybe ask, you know, he didn't have money for cigarettes or beer or whatever, you know, and he just wanted to rip like a couple hundred dollars or something like that. It's stupid, but, um, and his son was also famous because he was a journalist. His son, mm -hmm. Thomas, uh, he committed suicide. Oh, yeah. a lot of darkness in that family. A lot of darkness in that family, yeah. A lot of beautiful work too. It's not massive, but it's, it's quite a money. I don't think about it. I'm gonna take a photo. I'm gonna sleep with it. And this is with Katze. I think at some point I would like to own one of his paintings too. It's, I, I've said that several times, but uh, Ora Pranobis Lucifer was, uh, uh, it took us maybe 45 minutes to complete the whole song. Like, done, from start to finish, done, ready? Wow. Good to go, and uh, guess what? Only because it went so fast, mm -hmm. I would question its quality. Yeah. I'd be thinking, no, no, nothing good can be done like so harmless, so painful, so painless, so... Mm -hmm. uh, sure. It's just, and so, Throughout the whole writing process of uh, the Satanist, Ora Pranabis Lucifer was, to, for, was for me personally a standby song, an eventual and 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 the mo potentially uh, an outtake. Uh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh wow! And <laughs> it ended up a single, right? Uh, well, I we mean, it, it, I it. mean, it, it basically it ends up with being, you know, uh, one of the biggest life bangers. <laughs> uh, in every set list we, we put on these days. It's like, it, it's a song that you, you don't fuck with, you know, it's like, <laughs> boom! Every time it works, it's just, yeah. it's catchy, it's groovy, it's, uh, it's brutal, it's everything. <laughs> the song, like, during the writing process, the song that, that I've always, like, loved from the start, and it's like, oh, this is like the new quality. This is this sounds very fresh to me. Was blow your trumpets, Gabriel? Yeah, because it's just the construction of the song is like. I remember when we, when when I brought that up, when I you know bring brought that to the rehearsal room. I was like, guys, you know, we got to just start with something very primitive. Mm -hmm. Like you know, that's the main riff is an obvious uh, Beharit reference to me. I'm driving down the moon, like boom, bam, 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 raw, rawness. And like no intro, no, like it's like no epicness, just a raw guitar. That's what it is, yeah. and it drags on throughout like fucking two thirds of the song, and then all hell breaks loose, mm -hmm. and it's just going even crazier and crazier. I'll tell you why I love that song so much. Oh. When you look at the history of horror movies, like the best horror movies ever made. I feel like horror is not about jump scares or, or creepy faces, like real horror is about the spaces in between. It's about the spaces in between breaths. And I feel like Blow Your Trumpets really lets that space live and it gives you time to contemplate what you're listening to mm. and what you're saying and it feels creepy because of that. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. I really love the fact that it's just building up so slowly. It, I think yeah. this is awesome. This is something that I I remember that it was with the Satanists. We finally started to to exploring that that uh, gaps, that pauses. You know what I mean? That uh, I've always said that. You know, like guys. You know, like it's uh, so the Satanists is not going to be faster than Evangelion. Mm -hmm. It's probably not even heavier heavier than Evangelion, but. Uh, it's more human, mm. it's more uh, organic, and uh, maybe for that fact you will appreciate the record more, that it's just more human. So coming out with that record uh, throughout obstacles and problems, it, just, it was just a manifestation of self-empowerment and perseverance, yeah. and uh, it just couldn't 
come out better. You know what I mean? Yeah. Let's go to Barbarian. Yeah. Let's say hi to everyone. Welcome to the man's kingdom. Nurgle opened his first Barbarian shop in 2014. He now owns three barber shops throughout Poland. I've asked but sorry, like today fully booked. Oh. Which is good news, but I would I'll, otherwise I would host you. I mean, Better. it looks like a great barber shop. It is a great barber shop. Yeah, everyone here looks really happy. This is, I told you, this is the man's, uh, the little man's paradise. If one of your upcoming questions was, if there is anything I would like to change on the record, the answer obviously is no. But then again, I'd say the same after every, uh, about every other record. Sure. You know what I mean? Yeah. Even if there's stuff that I'm like. Eh. <laughs> I'm not really happy with this, I'm not really... So it doesn't change the fact that, like, yeah. do, would I want to change something? No. There are some embarrassing moments, you know, spots on, in the Bohemian back catalog. That I would listen to it, I'd be like, that's so f***ing lame and cheesy, yeah. and oh, of course. Yeah. But do I regret putting that on, on those records? No. Because it was, back then, me, at that very time, was... I'm always like, like fully behind what I do, okay? Yeah. So can you tell me about the recording of O oh Father, O oh Satan, O oh Son? Yes. Because it's a, an absolutely magical ending yeah. to the record. When we entered the studio and we were recording that album, there was, uh, that song had no ending. Oh, yeah. okay. So it would finish on uh, that part like, on the bus part. Okay. And then, I remember um, Inferno was like, uh, like rushing me and, and pushing, like, oh, what's the, what, what are we doing next? What, what's next? What's next? I mean, we're about to record the tracks. So I'm like, wait, wait. But when the right time comes, it will come, okay? Oh, I'm you know, pretending I'm, I'm uh, a Master Yoda, but uh, I'm quite an opposite, you know, my nature is very opposite to Master Yoda. I'm super impatient and very immature in that sense, but anyways. So the moment comes, we record a song, like we wrote throughout the song, and we end up there, we check it, you know, in the, in the engineering room, we see it, and I just grab a guitar, and the guy go like, they just grab it and like, you know, it should be something like this. Hold, hold, hold. Ba, ba, ba. Two notes, guys, no more. Just pull and then it's just gonna build and just go slowly, long, monotony. Then I played that and he's like, oh shit, it's awesome notes. I like the notes. Let's record it. Like what? Like this. Ba, ba, ba. Simple, primitive big we recorded it and I was like well sounds like a pretty fucking epic ending yeah nailed done <laughs> and how so about the spoken word part at the end that's where I ask my friend in crime Christopher Azarevich mm -hmm. who co-works with me on lyrics since Satanica Records I reach out to him we are right we're co-writing the song together yeah. uh, so you, you see my name and his name next to each other as authors of the lyrics and I told him man I need like a quote there like the caption that would just so you know this time like many other times it was Uncle Al that helped out oh yeah and I recorded the first take and then I was like okay I got the first take now I can do it better okay so I to take a second take, third, another, an numerous takes, and we were like, man, none of them is as good as the first one. Wow. 
So maybe we just did some tweaks, like maybe moved some words here and there, but the intonation and the, the, the heart that I put in the, that very spontaneous take was, was um, unmatched. Yeah. Overall, you know, it's a painful process. It's not easy. And trust me, the more records uh, in our books, the more riffs in my, under my belt, words, lyrics, everything, the more challenging and more difficult is to go back and every time try to redefine yourself. What the f*** we're gonna do now? Of course, you know, I, I, I wanna play myself. Mm. That's what, when you ask me what Behemoth plays, <coughs> the most honest answer will be, I wanna play myself. So we'd be jamming with Behemoth lately, and uh, I just came up with the uh, with the harmony. That is like, I think that's that's decent, that's nice. And Orion just made a point. Yeah, but it's so you. And I was like, you know, there's a million of bands out there that can not say that. Yeah. Because they sound like everything but themselves. Is Behemoth's music original? No. Is Behemoth's music unique? I truly hope so. Uh, is our music one of a kind? I truly hope so. Don't mix that with originality. This does not exist. I do, it, this word is not in my dictionary. But I do believe in uniqueness of, of art. I do believe in individuality. So let's get the f out of here. <laughs> All Thanks, right, man. man. Appreciate thank you it. so much. Thanks so much for inviting us here to Poland, and thank you for the Satanist, Loudwire's album of the decade, and wow. thank you for the music, man. <laughs> Super grateful for that. Thank you guys for watching, and stay tuned because there's more coming. Right? right. Be safe. <laughs>